Hey everybody, uh, good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Raju Rajan, I'm the president and one of the founders of Rewild Long Island. Uh, it's my pleasure today uh, to, to introduce the TikTok, as I, I <laughs> love to call it. <laughs> uh, our speaker is uh, doc, uh, Dr. Jody gangloff Uh She's an entomologist and she's a senior extension associate for the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program at Cornell University. Um, she is also, as I found out from uh, right before this talk, an avid rewilder, a supporter of sustainable landscapes, a, a volunteer. And um, so I, I, it's a great pleasure that I present uh, Dr. Kaufman. Uh, and, and what I would uh, request is for people to put questions in chat or hold them till the end. Uh, we will get a chance to, you know, uh, providing uh, that, you know, as long as Jody has the time, we can definitely stay and address your questions. I really love this topic. It's something that um, is co close to all our hearts simply because, right, I mean, we can talk about all the native plants and putting things in to make uh, a biodiverse landscape around us. But if your neighbor sprays or you spray or whatever it is, you're killing a whole bunch of them. And I almost think that sort of the ticket to admission or the first thing we need to do in order to make uh, biodiversity happen is stop spraying, reduce spraying, reduce our chemical use in, the, in our landscapes. So let's find out how. So without any further ado, let me turn over to Dr. Jody Gangloff Kaufman and um, ask her to start presenting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for this invitation. And thanks everybody for being here in the evening. So I work for you know Cornell, but I'm actually here in Babylon. And um, I have lived on Long Island most of my life and I care. <laughs> so um, I went away to get my college degree, you know, in entomology. But I'm going to talk to you about, and I, I call, you know, it's IPM. Let me just uh, go forward. So I I am the coordinator of the community IPM program which uh, means everything not agricultural. So what happens in your home, in a school, in a municipal building, anywhere in the community that's not ag, in including turf grass and landscapes. And so um, integrated pest management is simply what we call, you know, it's, it's, it's risk management. We're, tr we're trying to reduce the risk from pests. We're trying to reduce the risk from pesticides. We're trying to get people some safer ways to do things uh, that work. And the whole integrated part means we're not relying on a silver bullet solution. We're not just relying on one technique. We're going to look at all the different techniques and how they make things better and how they work together. So there's a lot to it, you know. So I'll tell you uh, a bit about ticks and mosquitoes. I had to rearrange my talk this afternoon because I had mosquitoes at the beginning and I thought ticks would be the better place to start. Um, of course, you know, I can start with this point. Uh, gardening is America's favorite outdoor leisure you know, activity. And especially since COVID, I wrote this part uh, before COVID, it's probably increased by a significant amount because that's what we could do with our yards, you know, and enjoy ourselves. So before COVID, it was probably 78 million people in America who were gardeners or identified that way. I'm sure it's more now. But, um, you know, all these people... Uh, almost everywhere. And I would say that Long Island South Shore, you know, as far east as Islip, we don't have the tick issue, but tens of millions of mosquitoes that we all face this risk of arthropod borne disease. And that's the whole point of what I'm talking about is that we're trying to protect people from the diseases, including Lyme, and all the things that go with ticks and West Nile virus and ehrlichiosis, and even our dogs can catch ehrlichiosis and Rocky Mountain spotted fever and all these things while still enjoying the outdoors. It's possible to protect yourself and not poison the environment and still um, be outside and, you know, potentially exposed to these things. So, so I'm going to talk first about reducing the risks from ticks. And um, I have to acknowledge the State Senate Task Force on t uh, Lyme and Tick-Borne Diseases for funding our project called Don't Get Tick New York. Um, that's one of that's our old landing page, and there's a claymation. There's a lot of information on this page, but one thing that I can um, one thing I can do for this group is I can I can hand out some some goodies that we have, including a tick removal kit and some ID cards and stuff. It's just handy little swag that works. But they they funded us for well, for the past since 2017. We've gotten money all um, 
almost every year to do this work. And what we do is outreach to people to uh, teach them how to first identify tick habitat, identify when they're exposed to ticks, identify the tick themselves, because that determines risk, and then um, teach them or advise them where to go for um, if you need tick testing or anything else. We don't advise on the medical stuff because that is not my, you know, that is not my expertise. It would be irresponsible. So, but our tick, our Don't Get Tick New York campaign, the objectives were to reduce human exposure to tick-borne illness. That's the holy grail. That's the one thing we haven't been able to do is tie any educational or research to the reduction of human tick-borne disease. But we're still after it. Uh, and we promote integrated pest management, which means, you know, reducing your reliance on pesticides and increasing your reliance on ecological strategies and uh, making tick avoidance easy to understand and accomplish. That's been our ultimate goal. So I'll start with the, uh, the informational stuff. Um, not all ticks are human biters. We do have a handful that are and that are really significant, you know, for disease reasons. So the American dog tick is the one we all grew up with. I can remember going to Jamaica Bay when I was a college student and a nice big fat dog tick crawled right out of my hair onto my face <laughs> to the horror of my roommate. So American dog ticks have been with us for, you know, a long time. And the Lone Star tick is, it is the number one tick on Long Island. It's the most aggressive one. And then the black legged tick, which is the one that transmits Lyme disease. So these three, I'm going to talk a little bit more about them, but these Three species are the key ones we have to worry about. Now, ticks are blood feeding parasites. They mostly ambush their, um, you know, their prey with questing bay behavior. So you see the top tick is a black legged tick, with that white, that red body. It's a female. She'll hang around on vegetation with her little tarsi up and waiting, and she can smell an animal with her little wrists, so like little, you know, so-called wrists. It's just little organs on her tarsi. And they will quest from ground level to about three foot high on the foliage, which we've noticed happens at this time of the year when they're desperate to find a host. So if you are on a trail and you're passing by some not quite senest, you know, Japanese honeysuckle, um, you might find ticks on that up high. Uh, ticks don't jump or fly or they don't drop from trees. And on Long Island, Lone Star ticks are the most common uh, they're more active hunters. If you were to sit down somewhere, they will come to you. <laughs> they will follow you around. And this was observed uh, as way back as the 1800s. So um, they're blood feeding. They don't feed on anything else. Even the males only feed on blood. They're very tiny. And you can see here on the fingertip, this is black-legged ticks. You're probably all familiar with this tick. Uh, the arrow points at the uh, larval nymphal stage. The second stage, so the larvae is the one that emerges from the egg, and that's the smallest. The nymphal one is the next size. This one's the most risky, and I'll tell you why later, but um, that's the one that's hardest to find and most likely to give you Lyme disease. It's this tiny little tick. Here's the black-legged tick. Um, you can see that the uh, yellow in that picture is the current range. This is a CDC map. It's probably not totally up to date. But this is uh, the tick that we have the highest risk of being bitten by at this time of year. Uh, you're still going to find some nymphs. Occasionally we find the larvae because it's been so warm. But mostly we find adults at this time of year because they're looking for their deer mammal, their big mammal hosts, and that's where they mate. They need high humidity. They are not going to be found generally in grassy areas, in athletic fields, in front lawns and stuff. They're going to be in the uh, leaf litter in a wooded area and at the wood's edge. They have a variety of hosts. They carry Lyme disease and anaplasmosis and babesiosis, which I'll show you. And, um, and they're really the number one threat, but we can't rule out the Lone Star Tick. Like I said, the number one on Long Island. Um, this is an aggressive biter. So you can see the four pictures. The female is the most aggressive biter of all these. And in this case, the female Lone Star has a white speck on that sputum, you know, that white dot. That's what gives her this Lone Star name because it's sort of pentagonal shape. But the males and the nymphs and the larvae all feed on people. And sometimes people mistake like a lot of these um, larval bites as chiggers. 
Has anyone felt like they've had chiggers, like they got a lot of bites, they have a lot of bumps on their legs because they're outside? That's probably Lone Star larvae. Uh, we don't have chiggers in New York. And Lone Stars are very, very, very uh, fond of deer and turkey. So as whenever you see deer and turkey, you're going to have Lone Star ticks. <clears throat> okay. The American dog tick, you know, sometimes called the wood tick, but that's not a good name for it is a springtime tick. We never really see the, the larvae or the nymphs. We only see the adults. And they are, you know, they've been here forever and they are present on most wildlife. Uh, they are especially fond of dogs, you know. So they're the ones that are about <laughs> raisin size when they fill up with blood. And um, I just feel like there's something familiar about them. But this one's the new one. I, uh, I wonder if you've heard of the Asian longhorn tick. And the reason is it was discovered in 2017 in uh, Virginia, I believe. It's invasive. It's invasive from Asia, but it's also found in New Zealand and Australia. And it is now known, actually that statistic is wrong, 12 states, seven counties in New York. It's much wide, much more widespread now. The thing about this tick is that it comes from Asia. It is parthenogenic here. That means that the adult females, there's only females. Females give rise to more females. And when you have that um, kind of reproductive strategy, they increase in numbers explosively. So up on the North Shore, Oyster Bay, um, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, homestead, these are taking over as the number one species that we see. They can be found in the woods, the fields and lawns. Their hosts are deer and what we call meso mammals, which is uh, possums and raccoons. The possum uh, myth that they vacuum up and clean ticks is not true exactly. Uh, but they also really uh, feed on wildlife. And um, in, in 2019 or something, five cows were found dead in a field in North Carolina because they had so many ticks on them, they had lost so much blood. So this is not necessarily a human biter. So far, it hasn't shown to have or transmit any human diseases. But you could become overwhelmed with them because they are, exist in the environment in such high numbers. It's just a warning. We don't know what the outcome of this is going to be. Um, hopefully, you know, the animals will be grooming, grooming them off themselves, as you know, the story goes. But um, they're becoming more and more widespread. Just a, just a heads up. Okay. So if you were to look at the different species, you can get this from our tick ID card. But this is a close up. You can see the black-legged tick has a special kind of what's called a scutum. That thing right behind the head is a plate called the scutum. And so the black-legged tick is all black and round, right? The lone star tick is triangular with a dot. The American dog tick is triangular and to me looks like coffee and cream. Right? It's got this mottled color. And the Asian longhorn tick is shown from underneath. And it's got these two little horns on the arms, almost like on the shoulders. So this is not something that you need to memorize. But this is for reference. We have this information you can carry with you because the disease risk is going to change depending on what species you encounter. Okay. You can also go to tickencounter.org, which is a great resource. So seasonal. And it's important to know that black-legged tick has a two-year life cycle. So the adult uh, group is active between October and March. And people will say, oh, no, ticks aren't active in the winter. I don't have to worry about that. But if it is over 37 degrees and there is no snow cover, you can find ticks anywhere. Um, especially Long Island, we have had very uh, mild winters in the past, you know, 10 years. And so you can find, uh, you know, black-legged ticks at any time of the year. And uh, the larvae are born, the larvae are the tiniest form. They're born in July and August. Um, the nymphs, they sort of overwinter and become nymphs the next year. So it's a little confusing. And right now, because the seasons are kind of weird, we find larvae, nymphs, adults at all times of the year. You're most likely to see adults in the winter, but you can find the rest of them at all times of the year. It's, yeah, it's, it's a little overwhelming and we're having trouble keeping track of it. But these are the different um, seasonal activity by species. And I don't know, you can screenshot this or something because it's a good reference to know what time of year you're going to find dog ticks and what time of year you'll find lone stars and black leggeds. And I can share this graphic with you as well. It's just a good reference for when you have to, 
you know, protect yourself the most. So May, June, July, August is really the season of high activity. But you have to remember that if you're outdoors in October, November, December, January, February, you have to think about black legged ticks and Lyme disease. Okay, have you ever encountered a tick bomb? I was out looking for ticks in uh, Connectquat State Park uh, on purpose, you know, <laughs> um, just out sampling, why not? And I came across a tick bomb and I had thousands of little ticks on my tick drag, which I'll show you what that is. And I couldn't do anything. I had to pack it up, and put it in a bag and go home because I couldn't bring them with me home. I had to secure them and I couldn't do any more collecting because it was, it was too risky, too many. Um, a tick bomb is where an adult female lays in a clutch of eggs in an environment like Connectquat State Park, where the horses are, for example. And all those little baby ticks hatch out at the same time. And they're all looking for a meal. So they will climb up. And this is where the chigger myth comes from. They will climb up onto whatever host they can find and uh, and try to feed. Um, and in that area, it would be the poor de the, the horses on the west side of Connectquat State Park. So lone star ticks are attracted to carbon dioxide in our breath. Um, and they're, like I said, active hunters. So they will crawl around until they find a good spot to settle. Ticks have prefer ha preferred habitats that are really defined by moisture requirements. So um, the American dog tick down on the lower right is going to be found in turf grass. It's going to be found in sandy soils and uh, drier areas and grassy areas, you know, athletic fields and lawns and things, um, wherever we have the activity of wild animals. And it could be rabbits, it could be deer or um, raccoons, whatever it is. Now the black, is this so? Okay. So the black legged tick, I guess the, the little graph next to it implies that the, the woods, the black legged tick needs high moisture. It's not going to be found in dry areas. So the south shore of Long Island isn't so much a habitat for black legged ticks as it is for the other two species. They are found most likely in the woods and in the edge of the woods. And lone stars have more of a preference for the edge and for dry areas. In fact, we found them at the the roadside, dry ass, <laughs> dry roadside in June in dry grass along um, 25A, I think it was, by one of the high schools. And we just found so many of them in this. It's a woods edge. It's an area where people walk and just unlimited numbers of Lone Star ticks in this, in this roadside. So, um, you know, it's important to remember what habitat you're in and what your risks are in that way. So this is the reason we do this. There are multiple tick-borne diseases in the United States. This is wildly out of date now because 2015 in tick terms is a long time ago. But you can see that these diseases are concentrated in the Northeast and they are expanding. So our top, you know, public health pest or public health disease, public health risk is Lyme disease, of course. But babesiosis is so common on Long Island and it's being misdiagnosed. So, um, so these are issues that the New York State Health Department is trying to tackle right now. Anaplasmosis is common here. You can't even see what's common because there's so many cases of disease in this area. Um, the good thing is that tularemia is not as common here. And that would be something transmitted with the American dog tick and rabbits. Um, and the upper Midwest has its own issues. But all of this has changed and expanded since 2015. And these are important statistics and it's hard to tease them out actually. But here is something you might want to screenshot. Um, this is our little graph about who does what here. So Lyme disease and anaplasmosis and the other five, four, three, whatever, uh, black legged ticks are really the carriers of the most common diseases, the most frequent ones. And I want to, well, I'll say something about Powassan virus later, but Borrelia miyamotoi is one of these emerging diseases. It's related to Lyme disease and it's being found more, more often. Um, if you move on to the lone star tick, we have ehrlichiosis and southern tick associated rash illness, which is like Borrelia and then other things. What's interesting here, you know, among these diseases is that the lone star tick is associated with something called alpha gal allergy. And if you haven't heard of this, this is where people become allergic to red meat. And there's an entire 
very logical biological um, explanation for it, and that is that the tick saliva has a sugar in it that when they bite you and the saliva goes into your skin, we're not our bodies are not familiar with that sugar, but that sugar exists in all the other mammals except primates. And if you become allergic to that bite, you can become allergic to that sugar, which makes you allergic to the meat of other animals. Very simply state, that's how that works. And there are lots of cases on Long Island where people are severely allergic to beef, pork, and lamb. Uh, it's not so much chicken or fish or anything like that, but other mammals. And then there's tick paralysis, which is its own thing, which can happen and it goes away. Anyway, there's, there's too much material to cover to go into this deeply. Uh, but these are the risks we face. White-tailed deer are obviously one of the biggest hosts of ticks. They're a host for almost 90% of Ixodes, which is the um, the black-legged tick. Um, one deer can produce a half a million ticks in a year. Uh, on Fire Island, you see more Lone Star and Asian Longhorn ticks on the deer's ears. You can look at them close because they're crawling with them. And deer are responsible for the movement of ticks throughout habitats. So one of the biggest reasons we can't be, you know, spraying the environment with pesticides is because deer will just come along and bring us more ticks and it's not effective. Um, they are a dead end host for Lyme disease, but they, they do, they carry it. I don't, I don't know if they vector it back to the ticks themselves. I should know that. But what's more important is the white-footed mouse, these tiny little mice, which are ubiquitous in our environments here, they're present in forest fragments and suburbs in their highest numbers. So Long Island is perfect. They amplify Lyme disease and anaplasmosis and babesiosis, meaning those disease organisms get inside of a white tail, a white-footed mouse, and they multiply. And it doesn't cause any disease in the mouse, but that is the perfect amplification host so that um, the mice are giving those ticks back the diseases. And you can have up to 90% of the mice in an area infected with these diseases with 50% of them infected with a, as many as three diseases. Um, and that means, you know, where we have concentrated people and we have concentrated mice, we have concentrated ticks and disease. Hence the reason Long Island, the Hudson Valley, and um, the capital region are really high tick density areas and also disease areas. So we think about preventing tick bites, which is probably the most effective way to um, lower disease risk. Um, we have to you know, consider avoiding tick habitat. And these kind of arranged in a weird way. I had this, um, this slide be arranged by designer in the lower Right hand side, you see a tick, a pathway for walking and everything. It's not very exciting, but it's it's completely safe from ticks, right? The lower left is a little bit more interesting of a, of a walk, right? It's, but it's um it's still wide enough that you're not going to come into contact with vegetation, and go up one to the upper left hand side that looks a bit mountainous, and uh, we're getting a little bit more narrow, and then we get to uh, number four, which is the top right. And you're definitely coming into contact with the vegetation in this, especially if, well, even if you're walking in a straight line as a hiker, uh, as a group, you may come into contact with ticks in this scenario. So um, if you're hiking in the kind of trails where deer are present, not mountains, but lowlands, right? Uh, and you have narrow pathways like this, you really want to protect yourself uh, so that you're not susceptible to tick bites. You will encounter ticks this way. And I always say wearing repellents is the way to go. Okay, so dressing ticks safe when entering tick infested areas includes wearing light colored clothing, putting your pants in your socks like it's the 80s, hey, and uh, sealing your pant legs. And what this does is if you can, <laughs> if you have boots on and then you have socks that are over your pants and then you've tucked in your shirt, you have created a pathway for ticks that cannot get to your skin until they are up around your collar. And from here to the top of your head is a much easier place to look for ticks than your entire body. And ticks generally want to travel higher. They want to go upward. So you don't have to necessarily worry about down on your legs if you've done these things. Um, just seal them out of your clothing. 
<clears throat> repellents are a good idea. I know they're chemicals, but um, we're not spraying them into the environment. We're spraying them on ourselves. Oil of lemon eucalyptus figures pretty highly. I'll show you another slide later that has um, some data about oil of lemon eucalyptus. And IR3535 is a derivative of the peppercorn you know, spice that um, is pretty effective for repelling ticks and mosquitoes. We have DEET, which is probably about the same for ticks. It works really well for mosquitoes, sort of the same for ticks. And we have picaridin. And all of these things can be used on skin. Um, you know, I don't, I don't like to use that stuff on my skin, but, um, you know, or my child's skin, but all of these things, and you need to read the label directions because the concentration will vary and that will determine how you're using it. These things allegedly make us as hosts kind of invisible to ticks, which is what that graphic shows. But treated clothes are really the way to go if you are seriously in tick habitat. Um, this is the one time we stray from our ethos of not recommending pesticides because permethrin treatment for clothing is so effective and so um, low risk that, you know, it's better than getting Lyme disease and anaplasmosis and babesiosis. So there are different ways you can do this. You can buy this product and treat your clothing safely and effectively in a, you know, in a safe spot and wait until it dries. That's going to last you up to six washes. So it's really like a good bang for the buck. You can also send your clothing out to be treated and you can buy treated clothing. And all of these things, if you are someone who works outside and is in tick habitat, these are the key things to do. Not just this, but keeping the pant legs sealed. And if you want only treat your pants, you're going to be protected. Um, because permethrin is not just a repellent. It will knock ticks off of you when you watch them crawl up a permethrin treated piece of cloth. They eventually become stunned and they fall off. And it doesn't take very much for that to happen. So we do advocate this as the safest, the best um, way to protect you from ticks. But once you've come inside, whether or not you've used repellents, it's a good idea to take your clothing, including shoes if you need to, um, and put them in the dryer on 125 degrees or hotter. Um, most dryers get that hot. My very old dryer gets that hot. <laughs> and Go and shower and wash off any crawling ticks. Check your body for ticks. Do a thorough inspection of your body for ticks. Do a tick check. Uh, I would guess that most people don't do a daily tick check. Uh, but if you're someone who works outside or loves gardening, you should be doing a daily tick check every day, especially for the tiniest ones. Those are the risky ones that give you Lyme disease. So here is a little chart. This is what our tick ID card has, this little information about where to check. Where to remember to check? I guess we, you know, we know, but um, you don't think about between your toes necessarily. The ticks will get in between your fingers and toes. They'll get in your belly button. They'll be behind your knee. They'll be on the part of your back you just can't reach. And uh, that's why a mirror comes in handy. And we try to, you know, couch this in brush floss and tick check. <laughs> try to do this every single day if you're someone who's outside. When it comes to tick removal, um, we do have these tick removal kits, which have I don't know, one here. Um, we have these tick removal kits that have the best fine point tweezers that um, we can use to grab the tick from the head. You don't want to grab the body. You don't want to grab the legs. You want to grab it from the head as close to the skin as possible and pull straight up. And uh, if the mouth parts are left in your skin, it's totally fine. That's not going to give you disease. The mouth parts you can treat like a splinter. You know, eventually it'll come out. You could pull it out, try to get it out. But you don't have to worry about it as far as um, it doing, you know, and giving you disease on its own. Um, a lot of people go to the ER and they go to urgent care to have a tick removed. And we're saying it's not necessary. You can easily remove ticks from your skin. Okay, so um, let's say you're managing your own yard or you, you manage someone else's yard or a school or wherever you work. You can do analysis and planning to outline the areas that are most tick prone. Um, and that involves, okay, well, here's some results of some research we did. <coughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. It was Kirby Stafford in Connecticut. 
Uh, where are the ticks? In their yards, in yards. They're in the dense woods. If your yard is contiguous with dense woods, you're going to have animals in those woods that stray out into the lawn. But those dense woods are where you're going to find, and this is lone stars. I mean, I'm sorry, this is um, black-legged ticks, no doubt. The dense woods. Where's the next most important part is the, the, the barrier between the dense woods and the lawn or the grassy area, which we call the ecotone. It's where the ecosystem changes from woods to grassy area. And then ornamental vegetation will be the next area, usually because there's a layer of organic matter, mulch, leaves, whatever. And that's where you'll find some. And very rarely you'll find them uh, in turf grass. And within three yards, we've found the same thing. So um, this is where you're going to find black-legged ticks. If you are so inclined, you can create yourself an inspection tool, which is a tick drag. Uh, this is simply a uh, take a pillowcase, a flannel pillowcase, or um, you just want it to be a little bit fuzzy, whatever it is, attach it to a stick or a dowel, put some string on it so it's comfortable to drag it and go and, you know, walk around. You take 10 steps, you hold it up and look, take 10 steps, you hold it up and look. And if you find ticks on that, you can use a lint roller to pull them off to then move along. But you can identify hot spots in an area by doing this technique. Not all the ticks that are in that environment are going to attach to the, um, the tick drag, but you get a regular certain number of ticks that gives you a relative idea of how many there are there and what species are there. It might just be, you know, it, uh, if it is Asian longhorn tick, it's kind of a big deal, but they're not going to be disease carrying problems for you and your pets and your children. Um, but if it's black legged ticks, you know, you want to take precautions. You want to stay out of those areas or perhaps keep animals out of those areas. <laughs> so that's the tick drag. Um, what are likely tick habitats? I showed you something before, but this is an interesting story. This is a school and the school has a, a large sort of turf area and a sandy playground next to a wetland. So you can see the sort of teal, teal colored equipment and that red uh, up you know, vertical kind of circle is this barrier between the grass and the sand and this wetland. And that's where all the ticks were because they love moist areas. And so um, my colleagues advised the school, you got to move this playground out of this tick prone area, or you have to push the wetland back a bit because the kids were, you know, easily falling into or jumping into this sort of uh, tick prone area. And the other place we they found ticks was along the sunny border on the other side, you know, that sort of north looking, I don't know if it's north, but the um, the upper part, because it was a shady, it's probably the north side, the shadier part of that wood line. Uh, that's where you're going to find the ticks, where it's not too hot and it's not too dry. So uh, this is one of the schools we worked with and anywhere that there was a nice wood line, um, and some grassy areas. We did find ticks in those wooded woodline areas. Um, we do a lot of work with schools and uh, trying to help them manage pests without pesticides. So. Now, habitat modification, I, I kind of said this already. Um, playground and equipment should be moved away from these field edges, including in someone's yard. My, my sister-in-law lives in Connecticut <laughs> and uh, they have wooded areas all around their house and all of their playground and swings and, and you know, the sandbox and everything, at it, they're at the property edge next to the woods. And um, they're going to have to move all that to protect their girls from, from ticks. Okay. Habitat modification is one of the things we advise. We want to reduce tick habitat by drying it out. Anything you can do to make it more dry in an environment, which may not be good for all the plants, but we can also modify the plant choices to adapt to um, you know, the modifications to keep ticks away. So drying tick habitat out, it might just be removing some of the leaf litter or creating a barrier of, of pebbles between a wooded area and your gardens or your yard and trimming trees and brush to allow more sunlight to hit the ground. Those things can help reduce moisture and reduce the risk of lime by reducing the number of ticks uh, that can really uh, take up residence in those areas. 
mouse habitat is also important. This is a good example of those old-fashioned, very ubiquitous uh, stone walls that may separate properties or elevations of the, in this case. These are serious tech habitats because mice love to use these rocks as nesting spots. So consider what you can do here. Um, I do have some some tricks that we can we can try in an area like this. And then invasive plant management is also important. Uh, Japanese barberry has been linked to an increase in the number of Lyme disease carrying ticks. And why is that? The reason Japanese barberry and multiflora rose and Japanese honeysuckle or the, the viney, weedy honeysuckles we find all over Long Island, these things concentrate tick populations because mice find food under there and are protected from predators under these bushes. So um, the habitat you see, that looks like the Finger Lakes, but uh, Konequat State Park is completely infested with Japanese barberry. And it does provide perfect habitat for the mice and, um, and also food. So this was a, this was a study, con barberry stand had a significant number of um, ticks carrying Lyme disease per hectare than an area that did not have Japanese barberry. And, and we think this is also important just for you know, ecological purposes. I, it always makes me sad to see the woods by my house infested with invasive species. So um, there's a lot of reason to get out there and manage invasive species. Now, one of the reduced risk, reduced um, you know, impact kind of tools we have to use against mice, and not mice, but uh, ticks themselves, it actually helps the mice, is to use something called um, a Daminix or a thermocell tick tube. This is a neat tool because it's a little cardboard tube that's protected from the weather with um, like a wax coating. And inside contains permethrin-treated cotton that mice will take back to their nest and uh, use as bedding. And that eff effectively treats the mice as if you were treating your dog or cat with a topical um, pesticide, uh, you know, for ticks and mosquitoes. And so this is kind of clever and um, it's not 100% effective because mice generally have their you know, nesting materials. One of the concerns was that we always hear this rhetoric that bumblebees nest in mouse burrows. And I went and looked it up and I couldn't find real evidence that that was the case. So I don't, I don't know that we've resolved that, but I don't think that's a high concern at this point. So we don't have to worry so much about bumblebees being affected, but this is a good tool and there are two different types to choose from. The thing is you have to use a number of these on a, on a property. You have to like throw them around in areas where you think mice. So remember that stone wall, that'd be a perfect place to, to put up some of these little tick tubes. They just go on the ground. They have very little, you know, ecological impact other than the ticks on those mice. So, and chipmunks don't steal that. Chipmunks are also a host of these uh, ticks, but they don't steal the cotton. <clears throat> There's another thing called a tick box or a tick control system for mice and chipmunks, which basically treats the animals like you would treat your dog or cat with a topical um, mosquito and tick formula. And so it offers them bait. Uh, they go in, they grab the bait, they get treated, and it kills the ticks on their bodies. This has to be used by somebody who's licensed, but it couldn't be part of an integrated control program, especially for an area that has a real serious problem with ticks. That's one of the uh, one of the options there. And then, you know, we funded this project where uh, Suffolk County Extension, uh, Tamsin Ye, if you don't know her, and, and uh, Suffolk County Vector Control, they did a study where they um, compared some of the pesticides to, they compared some of the standard pesticides to the, um, you know, low risk, Essentria IC3, and tick kills, and all of these things are botanical-based pesticides. Cedar Safe and the three below are um, low risk, maybe even, um, um, I don't know, not registered because they don't need to be. They have food-grade ingredients, that kind of thing. And so you can see that Cedar Safe kind of rises to about 50%, and then we have 30, 27, and 19. So um, what this tells us is that even though we have, we can use Maverick, we can use that. We can't use that in a widespread way. 
And even though that's pretty effective, it's not going to be effective all season. It's going to kill everything else. And the idea that we can use something a little safer and also still kill ticks is not a good one either. Um, Essentria, tick kills, Ecovia, all of those things are not tick specific. They will kill whatever's in the environment. So this just kind of says we don't want to be doing widespread spraying of our yards. We want to do these other techniques and, um, you know, 30% mortality probably isn't acceptable. And you know, I wouldn't want to spray something that has 97% mortality because I have a lot of bees in my yard. I don't want to you know, kill those. So, um, so the other techniques that we talked about, and I have to gloss over it quickly, um, those are the things that I would you know, hope that people focus on. But you can't just use one technique. You have to use a, a variety of things to protect yourself and protect your yard from ticks. Just a quick thing about Nassau County. Uh, I led a project where we wanted to understand tick-borne pathogen prevalence or distribution in Nassau because the New York State Health Department hadn't done any work in Nassau. Uh, they know more about the tick distribution and diseases in Suffolk. So we chose school grounds and state and county parks and public and private uh, wildlife preserves like the Nassau County Land Trust properties. And um, the schools were places where we could, you know, wooded areas adjacent to at least two sides of the schools. And you can see all the sites that we looked at here, the concentration of which are in Nassau County. Um, and in this case, the number of ticks collected were very concentrated in that western border of Nassau County. So the red is that, that's a lot of ticks collected. Now this work was done between late October and late December not even in the springtime and the warm times and whatever. This is in the winter, almost winter. So late fall. And so you can see there are areas where we don't have ticks and there are areas where uh, you'd be surprised how many ticks there are in Nassau County and on Long Island. So um, we also found that Nassau County and Queens had similar rates of Lyme disease in the ticks as other parts of the state. So Lyme disease is being, you know, um, it's being maintained in the wildlife populations and the mice and the deer. And there are a surprising number of deer in Nassau County and Suffolk County. We know there are deer. Uh, so our research showed that Nassau is not, not um, out of the range of what we see in other parts of the state. And then there were 15 ticks that were positive for Powassan virus. Now this is a concern because this is the first time it was documented from Nassau County Powassan virus is like West Nile virus, but the transmission from a tick bite can happen within 15 minutes. Why does that matter? Because we don't think about taking the ticks off of us while we're out in the field. We don't worry about it till we get home. And um, if Powassan is common and it's getting more common out in the environment, the case fatality rate is 10 to 15%. That is alarming. This is of concern. And this should be the one wake up call that everyone has to make sure that they are protecting themselves from uh, lone, I mean, sorry, black legged ticks at the very least. So um, I see that there's a couple of comments, and uh, I just want to remind you to do a daily tick check. This is, here we go, just a summary. If you're going to work in tick prone areas, wear light colored clothes, put your pants in your socks, seal your pant legs, tuck in your shirt, wear deep other repellents and do a tick check. This is the most reliable thing you can do. So um, do you want me to take a look at the pick the questions before we move on to mosquitoes? Sure, yeah, please, please. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I heard um, our homemade tick tubes using rose geranium oil or oil of eucalyptus effective. Um, we can't advise anyone to use something that is you know, kitchen sink or off label, it's worth trying, I guess. Um, but I can't advise you if it's effective because it hasn't been studied. I know that for a fact. So um, it'd be better. And and we also do not advise that you treat your own cotton and put, you know, with permethrin and then put it in some kind of a tube. That it, that would be illegal. So just say, buy the tick tubes. They're meant to work. They've stu been studied. They do work. And um, I can't imagine... If a mouse, well, a mouse might find those smells, the geranium oil and oil of eucalyptus, really distasteful. 
they might not like it. Permethrin doesn't have much of a smell. And uh, bumblebees use grass balls on the field that are built and used by mice. Okay, so, and Ecovia can harm bees, definitely. And medication, I can't talk about medication. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the thing, Kathy Redzel. Uh, we have been trying to see if there's a connection between um, the mouse habitat and the bumblebee habitat in a meaningful way that could make tick tubes um, dangerous for bees because, you know, pollinators are, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're all the things about pollinators. I have a pollinator tattoo. <laughs> so um, thanks. I, I really appreciate the comments. Yeah. Now I remember um, finding bees in a in a grass ball. I'm sorry, is somebody talking? Okay. I remember coming across that. Okay. Uh, should I move on? I'm oh, sure. And then we can come back and address the remaining. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Come on. There we go. Okay, I'm going to talk about mosquitoes and some techniques for mosquito management. Um, there are lots of mosquitoes that are important on Long Island, uh, including common house mosquito, but I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about a couple species because they're the ones that you and me as a homeowner, that we can do something about. We can't really do much about brackish water swamps and freshwater pools and wetlands and things, but we can manage our own yards and our own environments. So one of the most common mosquitoes that you find is the northern house mosquito. This is present, I believe, all over the world. It is a container breeder, and it is especially fond of wild birds, meaning it is going to be everywhere in the environment, <clears throat> and especially in suburbs and especially in cities where we have lots of containers uh, that fill with water. It's an opportunistic feeder, and it will um, bite at dawn and dusk. It's the one that comes indoors at night when you're trying to sleep and sort of around your ear, uh, Culex pipians. It's the one that invades New York City subways and doesn't need a blood meal before it lays eggs. So it is a crazy problem um, for city infrastructure as well. And then we have Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, which is also a container breeder. That's the important part here. These two species are container breeders, meaning they will breed in any small container of water. And that can be a bottle cap, a snail shell, the tray underneath the plant or whatever. Aedes albopictus has been shown to be um, very fond of breeding on cats. I mean, not breeding, but feeding on cats. So they will, um, they will chase cats around, <laughs> feed on any kind of animals, uh, cats especially in the environment. So if you have a bunch of neighbor has stray cats or outdoor cats, that's going to be supporting the um, Asian tiger mosquito population. And then here we have Aedes solicitans. This is the salt marsh mosquito. And this is important for Long Island because we have a, we're surrounded by salt marsh uh, for the most part. Uh, look how pretty that one is. It is a very aggressive biter. And when we have a full moon, I'm not sure exactly when the tides come up about a week later after the full moon tides have come, you can have a flush of solicitans coming in from salt marsh areas into communities and they are just aggressive biters. So these are three top ones. Um, Aedes albopictus and Culex pipians, they both can carry West Nile virus and Aedes albopictus is a tropical species. So it can carry dengue, it can carry Zika and these other diseases. We don't see that a lot, but, um, you know, these are, they present some disease risk if there were disease outbreaks in our area. Now, the mosquito life cycle is pretty simple. They are like butterflies or wasps and bees. They have a complete life cycle from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And they always um, live in water. The larvae always live in water. The larvae feed on bacteria and other microorganisms, which makes them vulnerable. We can talk about that. Um, and adults emerge, and the adults can emerge on a nice warm day in a nice sunny spot. It can be as short a life cycle as five days. So if you have a bird feeder out and you don't change that water frequently enough, you can be breeding mosquitoes. 
um, because their life cycle can be very short when it's nice out. So here's mosquito larvae and pupae up close. You can see the larvae have this like stick, this kind of appendage that is on the top of the water. And that is the siphon. They breathe kind of out of their butts, right? Um, and that is their way of living, uh, breathing, because they breathe air. They're not fish. And they can dive down to the bottom of the water, whatever container they're in, and come back up. And the little hairs help them pop up and evade the, um, the water surface tension and breathe again. And the pupae have the same thing, a little appendage that looks like it comes off the head. So they are air breathers. Here is a cute video. It's kind of mesmerizing. Of wigglers. That's how you know you have mosquitoes. You shake the container and you see this behavior, this wiggling. Um, and this is good fish food if you have a natural area with fish. But the fish to get to the very edges have to be minnows that have like upturned mouths that can get into the tiny shallows. Um, but those are those are our wigglers there. Okay. Some other facts about mosquitoes: the males don't feed on blood. It's just females. The males are actually to some extent, pollinators, because they feed on nectar and they transfer um, pollen around wherever they go. The females tend to stay within a half mile of their breeding site. And that's another important thing, because if you as a homeowner have mosquitoes and you do all the things that are necessary to reduce breeding habitat, but your neighbor doesn't do that, you're still going to have mosquitoes. And it, uh, it ends up being more of a community-wide effort to reduce mosquito breeding habitat, which can present its own problems. So mosquitoes have various hosts. They like birds, cats, large animals, and uh, us, of course. And not all mosquitoes transmit diseases, but many of the viruses we have to worry about come from mosquitoes. And if you didn't know, malaria is not a virus, but it was once endemic in New York. Um, there have been rare cases here and there, but when um, um, time of the uh, probably American Revolution, malaria was a serious concern here in New York. <clears throat> so what do we do about mosquitoes? Look at all those mosquito bites. <laughs> so there are options for mosquito management that are somewhat limited. Uh, we can eliminate breeding habitat, eliminate that standing water, and it works better as a community. There isn't much we can do with these kind of areas. These are natural areas. We have vernal pools. We have uh, rainwater in, you know, a rut in a lawn, and uh, we have wetlands. We have beautiful natural areas that are federally protected, and they're not going to be managing mosquitoes in areas like that, like Jamaica Bay here. Um, but in that lawn that has the ruts, you can fill that in with sand. That's one thing you can do. But there's not a lot we can do with the wild areas as individuals. This is more of the vector control, you know, that happens. In vector control in Suffolk, at least, doesn't happen unless there's a disease outbreak. There's um, mostly uh, only nuisance spraying that happens in certain communities. But there is plenty we can do right here. So all of this stuff, all this stuff that we have, uh, we can make sure that our gutters are draining and clean. The gutters are probably the number one place where uh, Asian longhorn, I mean, sorry, gosh, I get my things confused, but Asian um, tiger mosquitoes and Culex pipiens, house mosquitoes, breed. <clears throat> and those tires, uh, that's on the property of Connectquat State Park. Those giant tires were filled with mosquitoes. And that's a perfect breeding habitat because it's warm, it's protected, and it's always wet. And then we have just toys and stuff around the yard. Uh, we, we did a, I walked around with some graduate students who went door to door and asked the people in Long Island here, this neighborhood, um, if they could check out the property for mosquito breeding. And most people said yes. And we asked, do you have mosquitoes? Do you have a mosquito problem? Do you think you have mosquito breeding areas? And they said, no, no, we're good. And we went and found plenty of breeding areas because the average person isn't really aware of where mosquitoes would be breeding. So in that bottom left picture, we have a rooftop garden. So where are the mosquitoes breeding there? Well, those are those are self-watering, you know, planters. And down in that self-watering container, you have access, and the mosquitoes can find it, and they're breeding inside that self-watering container. So you know there are lots of ways that mosquitoes, you know, outsmart us and breed in anything they can find. Storm drains can hold stagnant water. 
Um, this is usually the responsibility of the vector control programs or the Department of Public Works. But um, when I see landscapers blowing, you know, grass and uh, their mowing debris and everything into the storm drains, it makes me completely bonkers because that's just increasing mosquito habitat and making the problems worse. The mosquitoes in my neighborhood are worse when you stand on the street than in my backyard. So we know it's the storm drains. And then there's community level uh, reduction of breeding sites. The residents of communities on occasion have gotten together to identify breeding habitats in their own backyards and friends' backyards and everything. And the residents themselves can prevent mosquito breeding by sharing information among one another to, um, to seek it out and dump it out, dump it out. And this type of community mosquito management really depends on high participation. I know there were two... Um, two areas in Connecticut where they were doing large scale studies of community mosquito management, and they were widely successful in areas that had good participation. So, you know, it's like a community thing. Uh, it's hard to do otherwise. Okay. Another example, drilling holes in the bottom of any container, you have four things that you're discarding, including, you know, garbage and recycling. Um, but this is really the big culprit here. We, you know, we want to keep that water that's draining off the roof away from the foundation. This is a good practice for, you know, home maintenance. But those corrugated, dark colored hoses have water. They usually have standing water. And that is where all the mosquitoes are breeding. And um, it doesn't take very much. There's a little puddle in each of the corrugations. So one, one strategy is to bury it. Bury it a little bit down into the soil. Don't let the mosquitoes have access to that and you will have fewer mosquitoes. But we see this a lot in landscapes, and especially in landscapes that are really well maintained, that that is a good mosquito breeding habitat. Gutter leaf guards are recommended. Um, there's, you know, not all of them work that well. Some of them are um, a pain in the butt, but it's better than the alternative, which is creating a swamp above your house. And also this is going to create other big problems with your roof. So we want to clean gutters and make sure they're draining correctly and not pooling water. Um, gutters are probably the number one breeding spot for a backyard. Have litter cleanup events. Litter, trash, is huge mosquito breeding habitat for Culex and uh, for Aedes albopictus uh, because it just accumulates water. Um, junkyards and any place where there's a lot of stuff. That's why cities, you know, outskirts of cities are really pretty bad with mosquitoes. And then fixing landscapes that trap water. Sometimes this will be a bigger project, a county project or something, uh, but it could be as simple as filling a ditch like this with sand and taking up the space that uh, would normally hold the water and creating a matrix that doesn't let animals or mosquitoes have access to that water. The water will still be there but it'll be in the sand and it will be inaccessible for breeding. Okay, we can block, okay, so the other option, we can block access to blood meals. This is using self-protection, repellents, door and window screens, the original IPM tool, and long sleeves and pants, just protecting yourself from, um, you know, mosquitoes. So again, we're back to this repellent stuff, the DEET uh, repellents, some people don't want to use it. Some people like to use it. I don't like to use it, but it's pretty effective. But you do not need more than a 30% formula of DEET to, um, you know, to, to spray on your clothing. And it should be applied only to clothing. I should have said that earlier. DEET is for your clothing only. It's not for children. But here's the thing. Oil of lemon eucalyptus can be as effective for mosquitoes as uh, DEET. And then picaridin, another interesting thing, it's a synthetic but similar compound to the one below it, which is the uh, black pepper compound. I don't know why they were looking at black pepper, but they found this chemical that is really pretty effective and it's pretty low risk. So the picaridin and the IR3535. Now here's consumer reports. Um, they do their research. And so we have the top one is a DEET product. The second one is a DEET product. The third one is lemon eucalyptus. Look at that, 90%. So um, here's your sweet spot between, you know, the using something that's more natural and having the efficacy we hope to get. Okay. Um, and I'm not, 
I'm not trying to promote any particular product or brand, but this was an, a surprising you know, result. And they do pretty good research there. Anyway, patio and porch fans can help reduce biting. This is a simple old fashioned technique that people use to keep mosquitoes from landing on you while you're sitting uh, in your backyard. Um, and you know, they've been used for centuries probably, or since, I don't know, since, the, since electricity was invented. Porch fans are used for comfort and to keep mosquitoes away. <laughs> and then we have the option to kill mosquitoes, which sounds like what Suffolk County Vector Control does. We can kill larvae in the water. We can use biological products and we can use pesticides. We can kill adults in the landscape or we can use pesticides and we can use pesticides. If we get to the point where we are spraying pesticides from a truck um, in a neighborhood and killing everything else and uh, spraying you know, from above, that means we've really failed to control mosquitoes and we now have a serious disease problem on our hands. Um, we wanna improve conditions for predators. There are mosquito predators all over the place. Not only, and I have just the water-based ones here, you know, mosquito bats and birds are all mosquito predators. But if we can create habitats that are healthy for these aquatic you know, organisms, we can reduce mosquito um, presence. And one of the surprising things that, is that there are aquatic uh, mosquito-like creatures, crane flies. If you're familiar with crane flies, people say, oh my God, it's the hugest mosquito I've ever seen. It's just a big mosquito looking creature. Those larvae exist in the same habitats as um, mosquitoes in water, and they prey on mosquitoes. So it's good to have some crane flies around and dragonfly larvae and tadpoles. Oh, so yes, the picture in the middle on the left is that crane fly larva, the dark colored one eating a mosquito larva. That's what I meant. And the little fish, the little minnows with the turned up nose, turned up you know, face. Uh, so there are a variety of insects that prey on mosquito larvae in healthy bodies of water. Um, I will always advocate for healthy bodies of water. Uh, and then larval control is not something we're going to do as homeowners or even as, you know, maybe even professionals, but we can treat standing water with low risk products. We're not going to be spraying pesticides here. Large rain filled objects like boats and abandoned pools. Um, it has to be water that will not reach another natural body of water. You can treat a container, even if it's a big pool, as long as it's not draining into a stream. And what I recommend here is using an MMF oil, which sounds bad, but it's really just a monomolecular filament oil or film oil, um, which means it is a, it's a petroleum oil, but it creates a super thin layer, which prevents those mosquito larvae siphons from breaching the water surface. And um, you can also in use insect growth regulators, which are just hormones that prevent mosquitoes from becoming adults. They're in the larval stage, they stay in that larval stage. And you can use things like Bacillus thuringiensis, Israeliensis, which is BTI, or mosquito dunks, which is the biological control strategy for mosquitoes. Um, those BTI, is it's hard to use in standing water that looks like this, because what we're doing is releasing uh, bacteria that has a toxin that's only toxic to the larvae of mosquitoes, but it is outcompeted by the bacteria that live in this murky water. So in this case, draining that pool would be number one choice, making sure it doesn't accumulate water, get rid of it, whatever, <clears throat> or the monomolecular film oil on top of this until it can be remedied, because obviously, there are a lot of dead pools around. If you look on Google Earth, you can see plenty of dead pools, uh, unmaintained pools. And um, they, you know, they are among the worst breeding sites that you'll find in suburbia. Now I have a little note, chemical treatment of any public waters requires a special permit and it requires a license and it requires all kinds of things. So don't bother. Leave that to vector control if it's gotta happen at all. Uh, I don't control their decisions, but. So, um, that's what I have about mosquitoes, and I'm sure I didn't cover everything, so I'm happy to take questions if anyone has questions. There seem to be more questions here. Okay. 
Uh, there was a comment about using tadpole screen fly minnows in the garden pool. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked, um, how do we keep leaves without a mosquito problem? And so I asked, in what way are we keeping leaves? And I, mean, I don't so think leaves was in, uh, leaf litter was more in connection with the ticks that you had mentioned right. earlier, removing leaf litter. I think mm -hmm. it was just mainly from hab frequented areas or areas where people would walk right on them. Is that correct? Yeah, I would recommend uh, blowing leaves into garden beds and uh, or mulch mowing them into soil, into the grass, uh, because we haven't shown any connection between mulch mowing and increases of ticks in the grass. Um, there is a study that recently came out that showed that if you blow leaves from a grassy area into a woodland, you will increase the habitat for ticks in that woodland edge. So that may not be a good, good strategy if you live in an area that has a lot of black-legged ticks. It won't matter, matter as much to the heat-loving ticks, so it's really a black-legged tick issue. But mulch mowing is great for all of the reasons, you know, to create soil, to, um, you know, protect your grass from weeds and things like that. So I would recommend that. Um, um, but by mulching the leaves, you're not reducing the habitat for insects that would otherwise um, overwinter? Oh, uh, well, I guess there's some question about whether the leaves contain insects. And the only thing I can think of is that some of there's some I don't you know we we haven't really investigated this but are there cat are there butterfly and caterpillar I'm sorry are there butterfly larvae caterpillars pupae <laughs> I'm tired it's been a long day um, are there pupae of insects in those leaves um, there are plenty of galls in those leaves I'm not sure how many it might be worth looking at to see if there are a lot of pupae butterfly pupae in the leaves but my tendency to think is that they're they're not there the caterpillars kind of go low down into the you know near the soil surface and then they pupate so i don't think they're going to be hanging from the tree and blown away with the leaves um but i don't i don't know exactly for sure so you know we struggle with this because we say mow high because your grass will be healthier but no don't mow high because of ticks and you know mulch mow but what about the ticks and you know save the leaves of course but what about ticks? There's some issues, you know, that need to be put together for sustainability. Right. Yeah. No, no. I mean, where, as you said, uh, protect yourself and try to stay away from the habitat and let everybody else, including ticks, enjoy the habitat. <laughs> <laughs> Just protect yourself. That's it. You're going to be there. All right, we have a few more things. BTI effective to kill larvae? Yes, for mosquito larvae, which we talked about. Um, what, what are companies like Mosquito Joe using to combat mosquitoes? It depends. Sometimes they'll advertise the, like, I don't know if they advertise organic, but for the most part, they're using conventional pesticides. They're using pyrethroids, um, which will kill the bees and the butterflies and anything in your garden. Like I went outside and saw a lacewing recently, <laughs> you know, out in the cold. So those are the animals that it will kill. It's not discriminate. Um, I I totally advise people not to use Mosquito Joe because what's that going to do? It's a party spray. It's going to work for the day. You have your party maybe, or you won't, You'll you know, a week later, and you're still going to have mosquitoes. They'll come back. So that's the last question. Oh, wait, no. Questions here. Hmm. Are there any natural predators we can attract to keep ticks, tick populations in check? There is the question of whether guinea fowl and chickens can keep ticks at bay. Um, I think the common answer is that they are also hosts for ticks. So as much as they eat the ticks that they see, they also host plenty of them as well. So there may be no effect of having you know guinea fowl around, but can't hurt, right? Natural predators. My colleague out in Suffolk set up arenas to study ticks. He put a certain number of ticks into these little arenas that are out in the wild, out in a state park, but they're kind of controlled, they're covered. And he found plenty of evidence of ticks being eaten, he thinks, by spiders and by ants. So, yes, we do have spiders and ants. Do you have a problem with ants in your yard? 
why would you kill ants? Ants are great. They are great predators of all the critters that are like attacking the plants in your yard and they will eat ticks. So um, I never understand the Scots, you know, uh, you know, the two in one, the fertilizer and, um, and insect control, I guess there's a weed and feed, but uh, to put insect control on the lawn, you don't, you know, we don't have grubs that bad. So um, you're just killing off the predators. All right. What about using leaves as a mulch in native garden that's not near a wooded area? Go for it. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, are there beneficial insects that we could try to attract with plants? What about rain gardens? Uh, it's a big question because um, there are a lot of beneficial insects that we attract using native plantings and flowers where you put, you know, flowers, you have prey and you have predators. Don't kill the aphids. Let the predators come and do that. Uh, rain gardens. I'm sure rain gardens attract you know, more, uh, especially birds, because if you have a little source of water, especially this past summer, my God, it was so dry, right? Um, anything that you have that has water, retains water, will be a good source of water for all the critters. Um, you know, rain gardens are good. What about the new oh, carbon dioxide? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I just was going to ask about dragonflies in that context. Do they eat a lot of mosquitoes? I mean, is that yeah. true? Yeah. So the picture I had up with all the, the pond life, had a dragonfly, um, they are nymphs, they're called, um, they go from nymph to adult, they don't have a pupil stage, but they are serious predators of all the other arthropods in a pond. They're like the top predators, they're the jaguars <laughs> of the pond. <laughs> and, um, you know, and as adults, they also prey on mosquitoes and other insects. So yeah, dragonflies are, you know, as, as good as they look. <laughs> Um, a question about what about new carbon dioxide mosquito traps? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know that carbon dioxide is going to solve a problem in a yard, but I've heard they work well. I know that when uh, Hurricane Sandy happened or whatever, we had a generator and we had our um, you know barbecue or propane barbecue out to, to cook and we were completely swarmed by mosquitoes. So I know that the carbon dioxide does attract them. Um, can it eliminate, you know, mosquitoes from your yard? No, but it might help. But it also might attract all the mosquitoes in the neighborhood. So, you know, try it. Try one. See if it works. Okay. Uh, leaf layer shelter benefits. Da, 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 da. Mulch mowing destroys overwintering beneficials. They may attach to leaves. I think that's worth looking into if mulch mowing isn't good because we have competing ideas of, of what would be good and bad. And we have to consider both sides. So if it is um, harming beneficials, we need to think of a different strategy, perhaps. But we also do want that leaf litter on the soil. This was excellent information. Thank you. Uh, and love to have you. Thank, thank, thanks so much, everybody. Mm -hmm. Have a wonderful night. And uh, I'll see many of you on a future presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you.